Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and in the street corners, that they may be seen by others. But truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into the room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need even before you ask Him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let's pray. Lord, it is an immense and unending blessing to know you as we discover who you are through whatever trials of life that come we are able to submit our will our wishes our wants our desires and we are once again renewed and transformed to seek something that is of you and in that way we overcome the temptations that easily over take us in this world and so I pray that you would strengthen your saints in this room that they are no longer subject to these temptations that easily overtake them would you help us or God be sanctified to know you more intimately and we pray all of this in your holy name amen remember and this is a summary of what prayer is Number one, prayer has to be, and it is, an honest, real reflection of your intimacy with God. Prayer is this litmus test. It is something that shows you who you are, where you are with God. And so look, looking upon your prayer life, you will see whether you're walking with God and whether it is intimate or not. Because if you're not praying, if it doesn't come out, then what it's telling you is that your intimacy with God, something is array. Something is missing, and so you need to look upon that relationship once again. Number two, you only earnestly pray for the things that you love. You can say a whole lot about the things that you love and whatnot, but at the end of the day, you pray dearly with all of your heart for the things that you love. And when you love someone, when you love something, your heart is always there, and you're asking God to be sovereign, and you're trusting Him upon the hearts and lives of those that are in the room. Um, number three, you exist as a community and you always pray uh, with your community in mind. What we have discovered is that you don't exist as an island, a Christian. You're not left on your own to defend yourself and to live alone. You exist in a community and if your Christian life and your prayer is not in community, then you are just kind of doing your own thing and you're not really part of that which God had planned and so therefore once again your intimacy with God very separate today we're going to talk and finally about the last phrase of this prayer that God had said this is how you should pray he didn't say repeat it he didn't say every time you come into prayer just say these things our father who art in heaven and then that's how you should pray he said no if you have intimacy with me if you understand my heart then these are the things that will overflow and the thing that he has asked us in the final verse in verse 13 it says to lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil this is a little bit difficult because the words that are used for temptation also is connected with the word lead. As if to say, God, do not lead. Do not you lead me into temptation, right? That's kind of confusing because you're saying, isn't God the one that is protecting me from all the things in the world? But in this prayer, you can actually hear his heart say, God, do not lead me 
into temptation. And you have to answer, like, what is that? Like, how can you pray to God who you naturally think will protect you as the one who is leading or not leading you into temptation? So those are the things that you have to work through in your heart. So what are the questions that arise? The first definite question you should answer is, does God lead us into temptation, right? Is he the one that leads us? Is he the ones that is causing us to fall upon temptation? And then natural question that will arise is how can God then be considered good if he is leading us into temptation, right? And then the, nat the natural question that follows after is how does he deliver us from evil? And you will have to answer uh, that question. The first question that we will address is does God lead us into temptation? And what I have to tell you is that it is difficult for you to see in your Bibles, but the word, the Greek word that is here for temptation is perosmos, okay, perosmos. And that Greek word could also mean trial or testing, okay, that's very important, okay. The word that is here used for temptation is always used across the Bible also for trial and testing. Okay, trial and testing and temptation are equivalently used back and forth in the Greek in the New Testament. And so therefore, why is that important? Because James chapter 1 verse 13, it makes it clear that God cannot be tempted by evil, right? He is not drawn, he is not tested, he is not actually pulled toward evil at all. There's no part of him that, you know, is connected to evil. And then it says definitively, nor does he test, I mean tempt anyone, okay? And the reason why there is a differentiation and you have to look through the text and the whole of scripture for the difference between temptation and testing, to make it clear, in James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4, it says this, I need you, my brothers, to count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And so what we find is that God actually does lead us into trials and into testing so that you may become complete. Your sanctification in this world, before you go to heaven to be with the Lord, it depends on you being led into the trials that He is leading you towards. Whether it's your health, whether it's working through what trusting God means, whether it is all the things that God te teaches you about your relationship with Him, you need to be led into it in order for you to be made complete, lacking nothing. Every part of you desires to want God. You want to be one who loves Him, be intimate with Him. You want to be mature in your faith. You don't want to go down every single time something bad happens into your life. You don't want to get caught up in your emotions when your family needs you. You don't want to wake up in the morning and go, you know what, I don't feel like loving my family, and so you abandon them and just leave. You want to be someone who is tried, tested, made perfect to love those that God has placed in your care. And in order for you to become sanctified, to be one who is intimate with God, it says God must lead you into the trials and the testings that he has planned for your life. Isn't it weird that you and I, most of the time, we spend our prayers asking God to keep us from these things? You say, God, I'm going through this struggle and my life is so hard. Can you get rid of it? What if for the first time in your life you understand that God actually leads you into those places? That'll blow your mind, isn't it? Because most of our life is spent asking God, God, just keep that from me. I will be happy with you. I will love you if I don't suffer. God, what more can I do? Can I serve the church more? Can I give more? And then will you take this away? Will you take this suffering from my family? Will you take all of this struggle mentally, emotionally about my future? Can you take it all away? Do you see where your prayer life is? You say, God, do not lead me. But many of you are saying, do not lead me into trials and testing. And God makes it clear, I must. 
I must lead you into places where your emotions are out of whack, when you cannot stand on your own two feet, when you feel like the world is collapsing around you. In those places, he says, I make you perfect. I make you one who reflects my son. I make you one who is actually light and salt of this earth. Instead of one who stands and says, God, just make my life happy and joyful and at peace all the time. What if it changes you once the truth is known that in the trials and in the testing, you become refined to be the person that God created you to be? Then it changes everything, doesn't it? But still, we have to answer for the fact that it says, lead me not into temptation, right? So there is a word play here that you have to come across. What you will find is that here is the key. If God does lead us into the testing and the trials, then where then is this word temptation? And why is it something that we want to be kept from? Because our heart should want for God to take us into testing and trial for our hearts to be set free, then what is this subtle difference between temptation and trial? The trials and testing of life, the places where we need to be led into, the sharing of the fellowship of suffering that we must go through to be refined, we need to want that. And the truth is now setting us free to desire that. Then what is the difference between that and temptation? Because temptation is something that you're saying, God, keep me from temptation, right? And so we look in James chapter 1, and here you will understand what the difference is. James chapter 1, verse 14 states this. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. The Bible is What it's telling you is that God will place you and lead you into trials. He will take you to the valleys and he will take you to the green grass and he will take you to all these places. But where temptation becomes real is your desires. The testing of people, the testing of us, it will always be that in this world where people deny God and where people are against God, we will always face trials. Whether we are standing up for righteousness or we need to be refined by God, we will always face trials and testing. But the Bible says temptation, it becomes a temptation when in your heart your desires turn it from one that refines you to one where you want to be satisfied where your desires need to be met. And then in verse 15, it says, Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. What you will notice clearly, there is a difference between trial and temptation. One, God needs you to go through to be refined, to be more like him. And the other is the same thing that comes in your life. And instead of it refining you, it actually destroys you because the desires inside of your heart, your flesh, is so broken. It is so evil that you turn that trial and temptation into something where you satisfy your flesh. The temptation occurs when we are given over to the trial that is at hand when we are enticed by our selfish fleshly desires. Instead of seeing it as a moment when God can be so present and so intimate and so evident that you can surrender your very will and say, you know what, God, I want this thing for it to end. I want you to take it away. I want to be comfortable. Instead of that prayer, the prayer that should arise in your soul is, God, I don't understand what's going on, but I know my weakness and I know I want to run away. I know that I don't want any part of this and what I desire is comfort and pleasure. I need you to be God. I surrender my will to you at this moment. My thoughts and what I think I deserve, what I am entitled to, what I want, I surrender it all and I'm asking you to lead me in this moment to what you will. You see how that is different? Because that's something that occurs on the inside when your life looks like it's falling apart. You can try to manage and fix it and you can try to undo it and you can run away from it. But the work that God is speaking of is always on the inside. It's not about how you pray on the outside in front of church. 
It's when you are facing trials. What is happening on the inside of you? Are you surrendering your will and saying, you are sovereign at this moment. I am giving into the fact that you led me into this trial. And what I am saying is, I trust you. And I will not take my life into my own hand and walk away and run away and try to fix it and try to make my pleasure and the center of this moment. This is why it's so difficult to live a true living Christian life. Because it's not about you fixing things and looking good on the outside. It is the very surrender of your will to God in the midst of trials. The Bible is very clear about what is happening and it's shown in Adam and Eve in Genesis. Genesis chapter 2 and let me walk this through with you. Genesis chapter 2 verse 15 says this, The Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, You may surely eat of every single tree in the garden. God told Adam and Eve, You can eat anything and everything in this garden. Tons. Every fruit that is most beautiful. I don't know if you've ever had fruit in foreign countries and I've gone to all these countries. There are bananas that are... If you peel it and just put it in your mouth, it like boggles your mind at how awesome it is. There are mangoes in Brazil that you eat and you're like, what? Why do they not serve us this in the United States? Like you're boggled at how awesome fruit is. In Eden, it is the purest, most amazing fruit. And God said, you can eat everything in this place. It is yours. I made it for you. Do you think God made it for himself and was like, you can have a little bit? No, it's all for us. He loves us. And he said, you can have all of it. There's only one out of the thousands, thousands I've given you. There's only one you cannot eat. And that is for our benefit. That we, we, as a human, as a created being, cannot handle the knowledge of good and evil. And he says, this is the one thing that I need you not to choose. Out of all the things that you can eat and partake of, you cannot have this because this is the covenant between you and I. Do not eat of this because if you do, you will die. Spiritually, because you are not trusting me. You are saying, I know better. I am God. I will decide what I can do and will not do. This is the fundamental problem. And you know what happens in Genesis 3? The serpent comes, and this is the word that betrays us all. He says, did God actually say, you shall not eat the tree of the garden? This is what God comes. Did God really say? That you can't smoke weed? Did God really say that you can't have sex before marriage? I've had tons of people come to me and say, where in the Bible, Pastor Bobby, does it say, you can't do this, you can't kill, you can't eat this, you can't eat that? Tell me where it says in the Bible, because what it's saying is you are asking God in the same way that Satan did. Did God really say you can't do that? That's how he comes at you. But he's not tempting you with the fruit or the weed or the sex or whatever it is that you want the desire in your soul the real temptation is this will you submit to God that what he wants for you is best or will you be God and choose to ignore him and choose what you want the temptation isn't oh man I love eating this and I love playing that and I love doing this the real temptation in your soul that the devil is making you answer is do you want to be God and take God out of your life? Every time you surrender and you take something into your life and you say, you know what, the Bible says this, but it's archaic. It's something that is terrible. I'm not going to do that. Every time you do that, it is not that you're disobeying God a little bit. It is you taking God off the throne of your heart, throwing him away and saying, I am God of my life. I decide what I want to do. I decide who I want to marry. I decide what I want to do with the rest of my life. And I will decide what is right and wrong in my life. And teenagers come up to me all the time and say, like, Pastor Bobby, I don't feel anything when I worship. You know, they're like, 
And you know, when I was at the retreat and the praise team was awesome and we were jumping up and down, I was crying. And he's like, Pastor Bobby, I want that feeling back. And I'm like, you live every single day not obeying God. You wake up in the morning and you don't think about God. You don't want God. You want to do whatever you want to do. Smoke whatever you want to do. Love whoever you want to love. And let God pick nothing and demand nothing of your life. And then you tell me that you can't worship him. Of course you can't. Because every day you worship yourself. How will church make sense? How will Bible study make sense? How will anything make sense? Because the temptation that you give into every day is you choose to be God and you throw God away every choice you make. Every time you lift yourself up in a group, every time that you become prideful, every time you don't attend Bible study, every time that you don't read the word of God, you are saying, I am God. I get to choose for myself what is right for me. And you take God and you throw him away. This was a temptation. And then it says, after they took the fruit, they were so ashamed that they hid. And God said, where are you? We're naked. For the first time, they had chosen to be God and they couldn't handle what it was they thought they could. You and I, the temptation that we always give into is not these little things that you think that you give into. It's not about pornography. It's not about cursing. I don't know how many times guys are like, Pastor Bobby, I can give up everything, but I have to curse. You know, Nova traffic, I have to curse. Like, I, I can't. I can't drive without cursing. Like every time someone cuts me off, every time there's traffic, I have to say it. Say what? The big F word. One time I was coming out of my uh, neighborhood and I saw one of our church guys and he was coming out of lifetime, right? And there was like, like a delay or something and he was like honking at the guy in front of him, but I was like right there in front of him, right? And you know, he's trying to love God and whatever. Not. And then as he was turning, they were honking at the guy. And as he was turning, I saw his mouth and he was like, F! Right? And he said it loud. I didn't hear it because we were in opposite cars, but I knew what he was saying. And he was like, F! There's an F you! And he was screaming it out. I immediately texted him. And I was like, I was praying and God told me you're cursing. And he was like, oh no, like what? Because he's freaking out. He was like, oh my God, how does he know? And, every say, and then, you know, eventually he figured out that it was, I was right in front of him and I saw him curse. It is not that you can't stop cursing. It is not that you can't stop having sex or it is not that you can't stop binging and throwing up and it's not that you can't understand this and that. It's not the temptation, the little thing in itself that you can't give up. The reason why your life is a wreck and why you keep feeling guilty and shameful and all these things is that you don't understand the main problem. You think it's that little thing that you desire. Maybe it's that girl or the boy. Maybe it's someone at work. But the real deal is in your heart, you've decided, I need to be God and God needs to submit to me. I'm going to choose my career. I'm going to choose who I'm going to marry. I'm going to choose how my daughter and son are going to turn out. I'm going to do whatever it is and I want God to submit to me. That's the big problem. He takes us through the trials and in the trial, he says, do you trust me? Am I God or are you God? Are you going to direct everything in life, including church and serving and your friends and who you love and who you don't forgive and what you're going to do with your life? Is it you who is God or is it me? And every time he asks you that question, you choose. And just as Adam and Eve chose, every time you wake up in the morning and you don't want to go to church and you don't want to read the Bible, you choose at that very moment, I am God over my life and you are not. Step down. And you're asking, why do I not feel the love of God at church? Why do I not feel Him when I am alone? Because you never actually wrestle with the reality of your heart. You want to be God. 
you don't want a you don't want a god in your life you don't want him to direct you you don't want him to love you you don't want him to lead you anywhere you want to lead yourself and then you want him to kind of help you out when you need it god never never works that way he says today let me ask you am i god or are you So then how can we overcome? How can we overcome all of this? First, realize that God will never permit trials without giving you the grace and the choice to choose Him. He says, I will give you the grace and the power to actually choose me. The big problem in our souls is that we don't trust God and we don't think He is good. And so we need to be God in our lives. We've seen where He leads us and we don't like the valleys. We don't like the alone times. We don't like some of the sufferings. We don't like it when He takes us to places we don't want to be. And so your trust level of God fluctuates every day, in and out. When you get a raise, you're like, oh, God is so good. When you find a girlfriend that you like, oh, God, he's awesome. When you get the job you want, man, God, so good. High five. Let's go worship together. When you get fired, I hate God. When your children go out of whack, you're like, God, I hate you. Why are you doing this to me? You see, you and I, we're so fickle about how much you worship God. We only praise Him when it is good, when we decide His actions are good. The big temptation is that you choose when God is good and when He is not. And you know, the funny thing is, He says it to you from Genesis to Revelation, I am good. Your heart is the one that keeps saying, you are not good today, you are good yesterday. You may be good tomorrow. But God says, when will I be God? And when will you hear me when I say, I am good? Because only then can you say, lead me to the places where I don't want to go. Lead me to the trials where it may become temptation, but give me the grace and the way out so that I may not fall, but I may face it head on, and I may face it with you and your arm and your love holding me. What he does in trial is he clarifies to you whether you trust God or you don't, whether he is good or he isn't. You answer. In the trials, you will answer it every day. Is he good or is he not? Number two, how do we get through tough times? God knows how much we can take. Okay, He loves you. He built you. He knit you together in your mother's womb. He knows how much you can take and what your breaking point is. I know that many of you said it. You're like, this is it. I can't, I can't, I can't do it. This is it. Like, I'm going to snap. I'm going to go crazy. Just, I can't do anymore. But God, so intimate with us, he tells us. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Okay? 1 Corinthians 10, 12. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. And then he encourages you. He says, God, I am. He is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Verse 14, he tells you, Therefore, my beloved, my beloved, the one I love, flee from idolatry what did he say sick right once again apostle paul is saying your biggest problem isn't the temptation at hand he says my beloved flee from idolatry stop choosing yourself stop making yourself god it is not you how do you flee from temptation when god takes you into trial you say he is god and he is good
There's a passage in the Bible. When I was younger, uh, we used to sing this a lot at retreats. <laughs> Refiner's fire, right? And we used to always be like, Refiner's fire. You know, and we all raise our hand. And when we were younger, we, we only had like five praise songs, like Create in Me a Clean Heart, Christ in Me, and then Refiner's fire, right? And so we were singing it, like, Refiner's fire, you know, like make my heart like gold that is refined. And you sing that song, and in your heart, you have no idea what that means, right? You keep singing it, and you're like, it's my favorite song. What it's saying is that gold, in order for it to become purified, has to be placed in a temperature so hot that all the dross and negative things and things that are not part of the purity of gold begins to rise to the surface. And the person who's purifying it takes it and scoops out one by one all the dross and he removes it until it is pure gold 24 carats when it is that bright yellow gold have you seen it it's like almost orange and it is like malleable you can like bend it it's because all the impurities have been removed the bible actually describes you and i that in our suffering, going through the trials, you become more beautiful and purified. You become one who submits to God no matter what occurs in life. You become steadfast. He describes you as one that who isn't like waved side to side because of the storms in life. You become one with the firm foundation to know what is God. That even in trials, even when your emotions are out of whack, you are no different because your foundation is Christ. It is Him. He takes you through it. He is your security, not you. You don't have to fix anything. You don't have to be better than anything. All you need to do is trust in Him. The reason why you're so unstable, it is because it's about you and how strong you are and how you need to be better. Isn't that antithetical to the gospel that says, it is I. It is I who have died for you. It is I who have made you perfect. Lastly, how do we get through all of this? Though the trials are difficult to face, there is always rejoicing for those who are in Christ. P.T. Forsyth, he said this, It is a greater thing to pray for pain's conversion than to pray for pain's removal. I'm going to say it again. It is a greater thing to pray for pain's conversion than for pain's removal. You will get to a point in your maturity where you will not ask for God to remove it, but you will say, refine and transform me so that I may know you. Is it possible? Yeah. It will be possible that you will ask God, I want to be more intimate with you in this than for you to remove this from my life. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 says this, So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations that I have received. This is Apostle Paul, greatest apostle, right? A thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. God placed it there so that he can be more like Christ. Three times I pleaded with God about this, that, he should, that it should leave me. In verse 9, I have cried many a times when I read this passage, but God said to me in my darkest time, my grace is sufficient for you. That should blow you away. Apostle Paul, the greatest apostle, the one who knows God so intimately, he cried out and he said, God, I can't take this. Take this away three times. He can count the number of times that he just couldn't take it. And he said, God, take this away. And he said, God's voice came to him and said, my grace is sufficient for you. And in that, he was found satisfied. Because he heard God. You know what Apostle Paul's response was to those words? Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me for the sake of Christ then I am content with my weaknesses insults hardships persecutions calamities for when I am weak then I am strong most of us want to be stronger Christians but Apostle Paul says when I am weak he is near his grace is sufficient
If you ever read the story of Job, it is painful and destructive. He killed God, destroys everything, takes away everything. And at the end of this amazing, amazing journey, Job says this to God. I have heard of you by hearing, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. In the trials, he became intimate with God. When you realize that the trials that God leads you toward is not for your destruction, but for your refinement, you can bear through anything. Your mind must be renewed. And then finally, how does God deliver us from evil forever, permanently? How can you rejoice? How can you look at the devil and say, I'm not scared of you? How many of you in the dark are afraid that the devil's going to jump out of your closet? Many people look under the covers, and when people walk alone, they're scared to death. This is what it says in Matthew chapter 4. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And then the three trials and temptations he overcame. And then in verse 10, Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Jesus overcame the devil that we couldn't. Jesus, in our union with him, was the second Adam that was perfect and overcame the temptation of the first Adam. It was once for all that Jesus died. It was once for all that Jesus defeated the devil. It was once for all that he died for our sins and lived a perfect life. What you have to know in your heart throughout is that you don't have to defeat the devil because he has already been defeated. Do you know that? Do you trust that? And that is what is meant in all of this prayer. The more you submit to God as the Lord, the more you understand that He is God and not you, the more you understand that Christ has perfectly, perfectly obeyed and perfectly died and destroyed sin and death, the more you will be able to overcome all temptation. Because you will look at the devil and say, oh, you're done. You will not be scared because he has overcome. The question that we must end with after all that we've looked at, Matthew chapter 6, is this. Who is God? Is it you or is it God? Let's pray. How many mothers have questioned the goodness of God when they have lost a child, when they've miscarried, or if they were told by a doctor, you can't have children? How many people have gone through accidents, have lost their loved ones, have become crippled? How many have lost all of their fortunes and in that trial and at that moment they had to answer the question are you God or am I? When you look at the cross do you see my goodness that I'm willing to give up what is most precious to me to love you? When you're facing this immediate trial do you trust can you see that what I would give up, what I would sacrifice to love you? Because I wonder where your walk with God is. Is it true? Is it real? Or 
have you looked at the broken hypocrites of the church and decided the church sucks? Or have you looked upon God and seen His perfections and decided we all need Him? We don't come to church for man or for the programs. We come because He is good. He is God. So can we pray as we close this understanding of who God is, what prayer really is for, can we ask God, Lord, where am I with you? Do I trust you? Do I trust you enough for you to lead me into the biggest trials of my life to know that you will be God and you will be good? Let's pray.